Thank you, Pablo. It's a pleasure to be here and to talk with your uh, audience. I'm a little new to Zoom and so forth, but uh, we'll try and make this happen. Uh, again, my name is Ross Gardner. Uh, I work for a company that we do forensic consulting and education. And today we're going to talk about event analysis. It's a methodology for crime scene analysis. And first we'll talk a little bit about crime scene analysis and reconstruction basic ideas. And then the latter part of it, we'll talk about the specific methodology and how to employ it. When I talk to you, uh, I'll use two terms interchangeably. Blood, or excuse me, crime scene analysis and crime scene reconstruction. They mean the same thing and I sometimes I bounce one back and forth. What is crime scene reconstruction? It is a distinct discipline. Uh, and as a discipline, it seeks to do three basic things that we'll describe. But what it does for us in the long run is it provides a formal, objective analysis of very subjective issues of complex uh, problems, major crimes that we're looking at. But it gives us a means to get through that subjectivity and find some objectivity within it. It's important to understand that what we're describing here, crime scene reconstruction, the formal approach, is very detailed and it's very resource driven. So it's not applicable to every investigative situation. Okay, when it's used, however, it provides a better understanding of these very complex incidents. Now the ideas that we'll describe are applicable whenever you're on a crime scene because you can be asking the same questions and thinking about the same things. But what we're describing today is formal crime scene analysis. There are three goals in crime scene reconstruction and crime scene analysis. And they're very simple. First and foremost, we are trying to define as many objective statements as is possible regarding what happened. And you're gonna hear the term action and an objective statement of what is occurring within the scene, we will refer to as actions. Once we understand what those actions are, what we think we can make statements about, then we're going to try to put order within those actions to understanding what sequence they occurred. The last thing that crime scene reconstruction does for us is that it's a means to objectively resolve major specific investigative issues that pop up. Maybe we have a prosecutor with a theory. Maybe the defense is putting up a theory. Maybe the investigators have a theory. Or there's some specific question relevant to the crime scene. CSR allows us to attack that and try to answer that in an objective fashion. I comment that crime scene reconstruction is a scientific discipline. And as a scientific discipline, we have to have a foundational theory. And that foundational theory in its simplest form is that nothing just happens. Now, sometimes people don't like that. It's a little too flippant, perhaps. There is a more refined way to articulate that idea. And that is given a series of actions associated to a specific incident, any given action has a unique causal and temporal relationship with every other associated action. The foundation of crime scene reconstruction is based on the idea of causality. The idea that objects, whether they're animate or inanimate, interact. And that leads to changes in state of those objects. Every action leads to some result, some effect. And of course, there has to be a change agent, some cause that led to that creation of that action. When we understand these cause and effect relationships, we're better able to understand what's happening, what are the actions that are occurring? And then in what order these actions are occurring? When you think about any scientific discipline, our theory 
has to drive the analyst behavior. So as our theories told us, we're looking to define actions, changes in state. We're looking to put order to those actions. And what that gives us in the long run, this is called unique phenomena investigation. We don't have a standard. There's no picture, video of what occurred. So we have to have some objective standard that we can test the more subjective aspects of the investigation against. You know, maybe there's a claim by the suspect that the victim was standing and attacking him when shot whereas the investigators believe he was shot while he's on the ground. Crime scene reconstruction hopefully allows us to decide which of those is refuted and which is corroborated. <clears throat> There's some supporting principles we'll talk about in crime scene reconstruction. A lot of them, if you've been in this business for any period of time, you understand. You may not have put these words to them, but the ideas have always been there because that's what we do in crime scenes. And our specific principles that guide us through this process are causal connection, the idea of cause and effect. We apply Lockhart's principle uh, of exchange, the idea of associations. We're going to talk about chronology, both time, when did something happen, and sequence, in what order did it happen. We're going to talk about Steno's Law of Superposition, which is about layers. We're going to talk about Steno's Law of Lateral Continuity, and we're going to expand that to the idea of continuity. Uh, and we'll describe that in a little greater detail in a moment. And then last but not least, we talk about spatial and temporal constraint. These five principles are what we're looking at using to help us understand the actions and the order. We think about causal connection first, it's very simple. Objects travel through space and time along a unique and singular path. Wherever you are right now, you only got there one way. You didn't take multiple directions and end up at the same time. We can't split our atoms. And objects, when they're traveling down their path, only change when they're is some force affecting that change. And those forces might be the interaction of other objects, a bullet striking the body, a bullet striking the wall, blood stains being deposited on the wall. Or they may be fundamental forces, gravity or radiant heat or something of that nature. But what goes on is these interactions hopefully lead us to identifiable changes in state of the objects in the scene, and very often to the creation of new artifacts, blood stains, fingerprints, DNA, whatever. Keep in mind, we're never going to understand all of these causation relationships. That's not possible. But what we're hoping is that we get enough of them that we can start to get a picture of what's happening. And to kind of give you a a, a visual of this, you think about, we've got a gentleman and he's in a crime scene and he's moving down his path. He's moving through that scene independently wherever he's going to go. And around him are objects. There might be furniture, as in this case, the blanket stand. And it's moving through space and time. It might be static in space, but it's moving through time and it's where it is. The two don't really interact unless they come together. Well, now let's introduce a gun. But the gun's of no value unless we introduce bullets. So now we've got bullets introduced, and unless we bring the two of them together and then shoot the gun, it has no value. But as soon as we shoot the gun, now we start getting artifacts. For instance, with the revolver, or excuse me, with the pistol, we're going to get cartridge cases deposited in the scene. So we have a new artifact. When the bullet strikes the victim, now we have blood stains. When the bullet strikes the stand, now we have a trajectory. And then ultimately, hopefully, we find the bullet itself. So all of these interactions help us to understand what's happening, where it's happening, 
And hopefully, as I said, you are leaving sufficient evidence that we can distinguish that these things are occurring. When we think about causal connection, there are two types that we're concerned with. First and foremost is the idea of direct, and that's the easy one. I pull the trigger, the gun goes off. Uh, I open the door, the door opens. Direct cause and effect are critical pieces, but there's another form of causal connection, that's the causal chain. Sometimes it's referred to as a hierarchical chain. So you think about that, before I can fire the gun, I gotta bring the gun to the scene and I have to load the gun. So there's a causal chain that connects those actions. In its simplest form, think of causal chain as they came, they killed, they left. Break that chain and suddenly the things don't happen. So somewhere in every action's history is another action that it shares uh, that association with. Now the direct cause and effect are the simple ones. Don't get too wrapped around the M1A, the V1A, that just stands for victim one action, uh, murderer one action, and then the A stands for V1A, action A, action B, and so forth. So let's assume that we're looking at victim one, action B. That action, whatever it may be, leads to some other action, victim one, action C. That's a direct cause and effect relationship. And victim one, uh, action C may lead to murder one, action E, and so forth. Those are always important. But now let's consider that within any crime scene, we have divergent chains of actions. Things are happening in different places, sometimes simultaneously, sometimes at different times. So if we look at the blue series of actions, that causal chain, victim one, action B, and so forth, and we look at the second, the yellow causal chain, murder one, action D, they still share, even though they're divergent and they're occurring independently somewhere, they still are going to share some action. In this instance, the one circled, the reds, okay? Sometimes those associations are quite displaced. So for instance, we can look at victim one, action B, and murder one, action E. These are very divergent chains. Maybe they're occurring at different times. But if we go far enough back in the causal chain, we're going to find some action that ultimately leads to the creation of those two causal chains. In this instance, it's two steps back. Murder one, action B. So this idea that all actions are associated, the, dis the association may be all the way back at they came. We may not be able to make any other association other than they came, they entered the room, but it's still an association. And that causal chain helps us if we understand it. So let's talk Lockhart's principle. Lockhart's principle has been around a long time. You know, generally speaking, we say that every contact leaves its trace. And in its original form, of course, it was the basis of almost all trace evidence examinations. But let's expand it to a more macro view. Objects interact and they leave evidence of that interaction. So we're gonna look for those associations. Chronology is the idea of time and sequence. In archeology, span they refer to it absolute is time and relative chronology as sequence. And what we're gonna find is we're gonna use very simple sequential relationships between several actions and we're gonna build we're gonna create building blocks that will allow us to put order to a very complex event. Of course, the recognition of both direct cause and effect relationships and the causal chains helps us to define this chronology ultimately. Probably the most important is the relative chronology, the idea of sequence. 
In crime scene reconstruction, that's probably one of the more critical pieces. When we encounter two actions, we believe something happened here and something happened here. To understand that chronology, we ask three simple questions. Did this action precede this action? Did it follow this action? Or did it occur simultaneous to this action? That is the building block by recognizing the relationship between different blocks, different actions. And as the more relationships we build, the more we start to fill in the overall chronology, the overall sequence of events. But in this day and age, absolute chronology is getting to be very important as well. If you think about it, very rarely can we go anywhere where we're not in the view of a camera, uh, where there's not some audio or video recording. Absolute chronology is about time. When did something happen? And so whenever we can interject a specific time into the crime scene reconstruction, we will do that. You know, we used, used to use time of death determinations and computer-aided dispatch. Somebody's on the phone while the crime is being committed and we hear what's occurring, some part of it in the background, where we can then understand when something's happening. Steno's law of superposition. First and foremost, who is Steno? Nicholas Steno, Nicholas Stenz, was a, is the godfather, grandfather, if you will, of modern geology. He wrote his laws in the late 1600s. And of course, archeology, span is a subdiscipline of geology and it is still applicable. These laws are still applicable and are used repetitively in archaeology. And what Steno said with regards to sup, uh, superposition was very simple. He said that strata and artifacts are deposited in a time order from oldest to youngest unless otherwise disturbed. So if we're looking at layer A, layer B, layer C, and layer D, we know that layer A preceded B, B preceded C, and C preceded D. Well, in a dig, an archaeological dig, that obviously there are many layers. But do we have layers in crime scenes? And the answer is yes. And they're there more often than we think. So here we've got the woman laying in her blood. We've got the cola bottle, we've got the cell phone, and we've got the purse. The bottle is beneath her hair, so the bottle must have preceded her arrival there. The cell phone is on top of her hair, so in its final position, the cell phone must have happened after she was down, and the same is true of the purse. The purse overlies her hair. So more often than not, if you take the time to look in crime scenes, we find layering. And that layering is very critical and very helpful in trying to understand what's going on. Steno's law of lateral continuity is another one that's of, of some importance, and we're going to expand it. But let's talk about what Steno said first. Steno said that disassociated strata that are similar can be considered to be from the same depositional period. So let's say we're in a dig and we have layer A 500 meters over here and layer B uh, over here. If there's enough similarities between the two layers, even though they're disassociated, layer E has interjected itself from some fashion, if there's enough similarity, we can consider them to have been deposited at the same time. Does this occur in a crime scene? Well, yeah, it does, not as often as we might want, but consider this example. You go to the scene, and there you find a gun and a dead person, and on the gun there are small impact spatter that are of a specific DNA back to the individual of a specific size, you know, a general range of size. And then, an hour later, two hours later, we encounter a suspect. And on the suspect's sleeve or on his hand, we find similar spatter. And it's the same DNA, it's the same size. 
do we not consider that to be from the same depositional period? Yeah, generally we do. But we'll find those situations in crime scene reconstruction not as often, but I do want to talk about continuity in general, because we can expand the idea of continuity and think about that just as a basic idea. In crime scenes, the continuity of a layer can be intact or it can be disrupted. So let's assume that we're at a scene and someone says, hey, the bad guy left and went up and over this hill through this grass. Well, as we look at the grass, the layer is not disrupted. There's no indication of that. Whereas if we had arrived and it found the disrupted layer, we would have confidence that, okay, that did occur. In crime scenes, we'll find these layers, sometimes cobwebs uh, in windows, sometimes in dirt, dust, things of this nature where the continuity is either intact or the continuity is disrupted. And that helps us understand whether something could or could not have occurred. The last one is an interesting one because we get right down to it, spatial and temporal constraint is about common sense. But the bottom line is in a courtroom, you and I cannot refer to common sense because somebody's gonna turn and say, the jury or the judge's common sense is just as good as yours, so you don't get to talk about that. So we have to be a little bit more specific. Spatial and temporal constraint deals with limitations in both space and time that will give us indicators to support or refute that some particular action occurred or did not occur. Spatial constraint is about can the action occur within the involved area? Is there enough room? Will it fit? Or for instance, if someone says, I was in point A in the room and I saw Joe shoot the victim, can he actually see that? That's another concept of spatial constraint, that visual constraint in that instance. Spatial and temporal constraint deals with, can that action be accomplished within the time claimed? And many an investigator has run this uh, path, path uh, when presented. Somebody says, I was somewhere and I couldn't get to where the crime occurred. Well, what do we do? We go out and we decide, is there enough time to get from point A to point B? So spatial and spatial and temporal constraint can be helpful when we're looking at crime scenes. Give you an example of spatial constraint kind of maybe make it more evident. Had a situation, we've got a ring of blood drops on a floor at a shooting scene. We got a medical examiner involved and as much as I love my medical examiner, sometimes they play blood stain pattern analyst. And in this instance, the, blood, the medical examiner looked at a series, this series of rings of blood stains and he stated that that told him that the victim had turned around in a circle, creating that ring of drops. So here are our drops. And if we look from left to right, the distance between the drops is about 25 centimeters. And if we look from top to bottom, the distance between the drops is about 20 centimeters. All right, here's our victim. Our victim is six foot three. He weighs 220 pounds. Can't put that in metric for you, I'm sorry. He has a shoe size of 12 or about 30 centimeters, and he has a 44 inch chest. Now his wounds were to both this shoulder, this shoulder, this elbow, this elbow, and his head. How does a man who has a 30 centimeter foot pirouette in an, a circle and create a 20 by 25 centimeter uh, series of blood drops. That didn't happen. So this is qualitative spatial constraint. We say, hey, it won't fit. He won't fit. And we know that this idea that he turned in a circle didn't happen. 
sometimes uh, with spatial constraint, we can define that qualitatively. We can put it into numbers. All right, so these are some background ideas. We've got a theory. Our theory in its simplest form is nothing just happens. We've got some principles that we describe, causal connection, Locard's principle, chronology, superposition, if you like, just say layers, layers, continuity, is it disrupted, is it not disrupted, and spatial and temporal constraint. Now, what we need is a methodology to put this stuff in play. And the methodology we're gonna talk about today is called event analysis. And we'll talk, there's multiple methodologies out there. They all follow similar paths, but I'll describe event analysis. And keep in mind, all of this overlays the basic idea of scientific method. We are asking and answering small questions in order to answer a larger, more complex question. Why do we need methodology? Anyone who understands the basic theory and understands these principles could arbitrarily apply them in a crime scene and probably come to some opinion and probably gain some knowledge. But methodology is what defines work and effort as scientific. Because a methodology puts us on a path, keeps us with a focus, and we're not doing things willy-nilly or haphazardly. By following the same path repetitively, we're more likely to produce verifiable results. Whereas if we do it haphazardly, we may not get that. So understanding and applying an established methodology is very important. Every once in a while we encounter crime scene analysts who just say, well, I do it kind of like Nike, you have to have direction, you have to have focus, and methodology also provides standards and controls that keep us on our path. There are certainly various methodologies. Uh, the primary published methodologies include event analysis, which Tom Bevel and I articulated some years ago, and be very clear, we didn't invent anything. What we did is we took all of the themes and information that had been provided in the 100 years previous where people were talking about crime scene analysis, and we just tightened it up and articulated it a little more distinctly. That's all we did. So we didn't invent anything, we just articulated it. There's another one out there, if you know Chisholm and Reinerson's book, it's called storyboard. Again, very, very similar to event analysis. It does not vary in any dramatic fashion. It might use different terms, might use uh, different thought processes generally, but in the big path, it follows the same path. Multilinear event sequencing, MES, is an interesting one. This one comes from outside of crime scene investigation. It comes from unique phenomena investigation, uh, traffic accidents, major traffic accidents, major uh, aircraft accidents, uh, manufacturing accidents of Bhopal, uh, Deepwater Horizon, where again, we have no standard to go back and understand it. The people need to go back and understand what happened, why it happened. So Potentially, it will never happen again. We can make, we can mitigate the risks. This was uh, developed by Ludwig Benner. But interestingly enough, I compared event analysis and multilinear event sequencing in a paper some time ago, and there is little, if any, difference between the two methodologies. Crime scenes are unique phenomena investigation. Again, we don't have a standard to compare to. We're working in the blind. So we'll discuss event analysis. I want to start by talking about some basics. There's some words that I'll use. The crime 
and or the incident, sometimes I describe it as the incident, because not everything we investigate is a crime, but the incident encompasses what we're investigating, what happened here. That incident is made up of macro components. We'll call them events. Think of them as like chapters in a book. They came, they began a burglary, they were interrupted in the burglary by the homeowner, they killed the homeowner, they continued the burglary, they left. So they're like chapters in a book. Each chapter tells us something about what's going on in the big picture. Each chapter is made up of those actions. And originally, I used to use the term event segments. I still refer to it as event segments. I've kind of just gone to actions now, but event segment or actions are like snapshots of the crime. Imagine that we were there at the very moment that things were changing and we could snap a picture and say, oh, there's the bullet striking the victim. There's the bullet exiting, striking the wall. Actions are the snapshots. Every action has to be based upon evidence and data. They should not be inferred. And they should be based upon objective evidence and data, which means crime scenes and forensic data. So if you think about it, we reverse engineer a crime scene analysis. From the data, I can define a variety of actions. The more actions I have, the more I understand what's happening in a given event. And the more I can fill in all of the events, the more I understand what's happening in the bigger picture. This information ultimately is used, again, to test the more subjective aspects of any criminal investigation. What people are telling us, what we believe, any theories that are being presented to us, they help us understand what we should or should not believe. So event analysis is pretty simple. We start with the basic. You got to have your data. So we collect data. We'll talk about each step independently. We then set forth those actions. We look at the data and we say, okay, what actions can we state based upon the data present? Then we try to put those actions, which come to us randomly, into little pots because we can't take this on as a big picture. It'd be like taking on a jigsaw puzzle where there's 500 pieces. It's not going to work. So we have to find related actions that we can work little pods of to understand. We then sequence those actions for each of those areas or events or however we choose to break it out. We'll talk about auditing. Auditing is just the idea of that when we're presented with a contradiction or a contradictory information, we have to run that down the rabbit hole and see if we can resolve the contradiction. And we certainly encounter contradictions in crime scenes. Once we get to that point, now we know what's going on over here. We know what's going on over here. We want to try and order the events themselves. In other words, we're going to try and bring the whole picture back together. And then ultimately, we're going to complete the flow chart. Now, we don't talk a lot about flow charting here, but you'll see some examples. The flow chart is a critical piece. Back when we start sequencing in step four, as we start to understand the order of sequence, we have to capture that in a physical document. If we don't, these complex scenes become too convoluted and too complex to keep straight in our head. So ultimately, we're going to have a document, a flowchart that describes the actions and the order of what in which they're occurring. So we complete that and then we validate it. And by validation, I mean simply that we sit down and we really challenge what we've said and what we've uh, written. And then, of course, Ultimately, we need to have a peer review. We need someone to come in after we're done, after we think we know what we know, and challenge what we've said. So let's talk collect data. Where does our data come from? Remember, actions are based on, they're like snapshots of the crime scene. 
Thus, they have to be based on physical evidence. They have to be based on some type of evidence. So the crime scene, the conditions and the context we find there, whether it's as we're there working it or later on when we're going through the photographs, when we're looking at them in greater depth. We gain data from the artifacts on scene. And of course, we send those artifacts off to specialists who look for fingerprints and DNA and trace and whatever. The more refined the data, the more refined the actions become. And of course, forensic pathology. We can't live without our forensic pathologist because the body is an artifact and there's a lot of important information that comes for, to us from the autopsy information. But keep in mind, we want to use objective data. We don't want to pursue testimonial evidence. Testimonial evidence is subjective. In 1895, Hans Gross, the father of the modern criminal investigation, wrote the first criminal investigation text. Uh, it was Handbook für Untersuchungsrichter, that's German, Handbook for Investigators. In it, he said very simply, and this is 1895, he said, when investigators go around keeping testimony upon testimony, they will be led from the truth. Gross was a proponent of crime scene investigations, crime scene analysis. He is the reason we do what we do in crime scenes today. So we, we're not going to introduce testimonial evidence if at all possible. And if we do it, we're going to use it very, very cautiously. The crime scene analysis is used to test the testimonial evidence, whether we should believe it or not. So we have our data. As we go through the data, we have to ask questions. Remember, we're using scientific method. We have to figure out where our actions are. And every time we encounter an object or some data element, there are four questions we have to ask of ourselves or ask of that item. And those four questions should always be in your mind. On scene, off scene, doesn't matter. We're constantly asking these four questions. First and foremost, what is it? It's a gun. It's a blood stain. It's a bullet. Well, those are the easy ones. But how often do we encounter objects in crime scenes? We don't have a clue what they are. We have to run that down. The next question is, what function did it serve? Just because an item has a particular function doesn't mean it was used in that fashion. So a bookend in the scene may be a bookend, but it may have been used as a blunt instrument. Some pantyhose found in the scene may have been used as a ligature. So not only what is it, but what function did it serve here? Then we look, I, I think I'm too far. I might apologize, I'm on the wrong one. Let me get you where I need to have you. I got two screens and every once in a while I look at the wrong one. So these are our questions. The third question is, what interrelationships does it have to other items of evidence? What associations can we make? And this is a broad question. DNA obviously makes associations. Fingerprints make associations. Trace evidence make associations. But we find other associations. Uh, in bloodstain pattern analysis, we may find a cast off rising on a wall, and then there's impact spatter. That probably represents an association. The cast off is part and parcel to the attack that was occurring where the impact spatter was going. So there's no limit to asking this question. There are many, many associations. We have to keep our head on a swivel and really look for well, how do I make these different associations? And then the last one goes to that issue of chronology. What does this data element, what does this artifact tell me about time and sequence. So with those four questions in mind, I'm looking at everything I'm seeing in the scene and I'm going through this repetitively and looking and asking and answering wherever possible. 
it's important to understand what an action is. An action is not a statement of evidence. There's a bullet hole uh, on the wall. There is a blood stain on the door. An action is a statement. And in order to define an action, we have to have an actor. What is changing? What's undergoing change? Maybe that's a person, maybe that's an artifact. Maybe that's a piece of furniture, a wall, whatever. What is the action? What is the nature of the change that's occurring? We should have a general location. Granted, we may not be able to find exactly where that action occurred, but we should have a general understanding of where that action is occurring within our scene, a general understanding. The more precise we can make it, obviously, the better off we are. The last one is important as well. We have to have at least one temporal relationship to some other action, some other associated action, a way to connect it to the incident. Now you think about that for a moment. I have never been in a virgin crime scene, a crime scene where no human being had ever been before that crime occurred. So we go into crime scenes and there are artifacts and context present that have absolutely nothing to do with what we're investigating. We've all heard that at some point, you found a fingerprint in the crime scene and it isn't my client's. That must be the killer. Well, when was that fingerprint deposited? A day before? A week before? A month before? So when we have an action, in order to be confident this action belongs within the crime scene analysis, we have to show that one temporal relationship, some way to connect it back to something that's going on that we're actually investigating. So remember, actions are not statements of evidence. What they are is we take the evidence and the data and we reduce it down to a statement. So the presence of a cartridge case and a bullet in the wall, that's the data, that's the evidence. That tells us that a bullet was fired along some particular trajectory. The presence of an impact pattern blood stain at a particular location that belongs to our victim and he has wounds tells us that there was a force acting on the victim in a particular location. So always define your actions, not as evidence, but reduce them down to what they tell you. What do you know based upon this item or these items of evidence? As we go through and we define these actions, the direct cause and effect relationships are always going to be important, but we're also going to find some unique actions that are going on that we may or may not think are important to us. So let's talk about causation stability. And think of it this way, causation stability relates to the idea that we have a chain of actions that ultimately end up in some result. Our guy is dead on the floor. Some of the actions that we identify are contingent. They are dependent on that ultimate result, or the ultimate result is dependent upon the action more appropriately. But then again, we will encounter actions. We'll know something's happening, and those are not dependent. They may be non-contingent. You know, a, an item was knocked over. Uh, a piece of paper was deposited on the floor. These don't, these are not dependent on the ultimate end result of what we're investigating, that dead guy. And to make some sense of that, I'll give you a hypothetical. So imagine that I'm taking a trip and I'm gonna travel to Seattle. I'm gonna fly in seat 32C. I'm gonna transfer in Salt Lake City. I arrive and I take an Uber to my destination, the way the waterfront Marriott. And then I go to the Starbucks next to that the following day 
where I meet my future spouse and I fall madly in love. So I move to Seattle, I get married and the child is born. We have a causal chain. Child is born is the ultimate effect. The travel to Seattle, staying at the waterfront Marriott, going to Starbucks, meeting the person are all contingent. They are dependent to ensure that the end result, the child is born. If I don't travel and I stay at home and do this on Zoom, then I'm not going to meet the future spouse because I'm not going to be at the Starbucks. Thus, the child will never be born. If I stay instead of the waterfront Marriott, I go to the airport Marriott. Well, uh, when I go to Starbucks, I'm going to go to a different Starbucks. Thus, I will not meet my future spouse and thus the child will not be born. So these are contingent. That ultimate effect, these are very important to getting there. On the other hand, let's say that when I arrive at the airport, they say, hey, Mr. Gardner, we're going to upgrade you. We're putting you in 6C. So now I'm up in first class. That doesn't change this causal chain. The child's still going to be born. Or maybe when I get to the airport, I can't find an Uber. So instead, I take a yellow cab. But it still takes me to the waterfront Marriott, and the causal chain continues, and the child is born. So both forms of these actions occur. We're going to see both forms, the really critical ones, the ones that really tell us a lot. And then we're going to encounter these random ones that may at the time seem of no importance. But very often they do have an importance, and we'll talk about that. Because what they may often do when we're trying to put everything back together is they may allow us to correlate the sequence of very divergent paths of actions. So what I'm really telling you is that when you encounter these non-contingent, these non-dependent actions, don't ignore them. Keep them in mind. You know they happened. And at some point, they may help bring the big picture together. When we talk about actions, I like to talk about documenting them. When you are looking at data, you think about a criminal investigation, you think about all the forensic reports, all the hundreds of photographs that may come to you, all that time in your notes spent on scene, all the information in the pathology report, that's overwhelming at times. And every once in a while, we'll be going through and we'll see one piece of data somewhere and then we'll correlate to something we saw in the pathology report or whatever. And suddenly we go, aha, that allows me to make a statement of action. These actions come to us in a completely haphazard format. There's no order to them. We just recognize that given these pieces of information, I can make this statement. When you know what that information is, you've got to capture it, okay? You have to make a statement, what does it tell me? And then you have to capture that data right then and right there. Because if you don't document the action, if you say, well, I'll come back to that and I'll write it down later, two hours later, you may forget that you made this correlation. It's completely possible given the complexity of the criminal investigation. And if you don't capture the data, where specifically you found that information, uh, that'll come back and bite you as well. You've got to capture that right then and right there. And be specific. If you're looking at a specific photograph, when you write the action, you state what photograph you were looking at what page on the pathology report you were looking at where you found the information, what page on a particular DNA report you were looking at when you found the information. If you don't capture that up front, you're going to create a lot of grief for yourself because what happens is you know it's there and then you have to go back and research through all that information trying to find it. Uh, I've done it many a time. It's not fun. Talking about documenting actions, again, the actions are going to come to us completely random. They don't show up in order. Don't worry about that. 
and don't try when you're defining actions to put related actions together right up front. That's a particular step, okay? That's the next stage. Now, if there are obvious relationships, you see, for instance, the shot was fired, striking a wall, the victim was upright and then received a perforating shot, and the victim transitioned to a kneeling position. Based on the data, you're able to make those three statements. They have an obvious relationship. Sure, put them together. But don't get too worried about making relationships yet. Right now, we're just looking through the data, saying, what, if anything, can I make statements about? What's going on? What's changing? And that leads us to the next step, and that is seeking related actions. Think about the jigsaw puzzle mindset. We use it quite often in criminal investigations, crime scenes. Our investigation is a giant jigsaw puzzle. All of the pieces are, and the clues and the data and the artifacts are our puzzle pieces. You can't deal with the puzzle in its entirety. You got to deal with smaller sections of the puzzle individually in order to get anywhere. Now you can go in and you could lay out all your puzzle pieces and you might haphazardly or luckily put one or two pieces together. But generally, that's not going to lead you anywhere. So what we're going to do is once we have all these actions identified, we're going to start seeking relationships. Now to do this, there are various ways. Remember that the incident is made up of macro components, those events. Sometimes those are very apparent to us. Again, they came in, they started the burglary, they were interrupted, they killed, they continued the burglary, they left. If that's the case, if it's very clear what some of those events are, you can make and put your associations based on entry and burglary, victim interaction and homicide and then departure. You can connect or collect the pieces of the puzzle that relate or appear to relate to that particular event. If the events are not particularly clear, if we're in one of those scenes and it's, it's very convoluted, very confusing, that's okay. You can use areas. You can say, okay, I'm gonna look for actions related to the bedroom, to the kitchen, or wherever you have activity ongoing, or maybe actions related to one victim, actions related to another victim. There's no absolute way to look at this in terms of defining where you're gonna put your little pots of puzzle pieces together. As long as you're looking at it and it makes sense to you in the context presented, you're okay. But you've gotta go through the step. You've gotta get your little pockets of pieces. Because once you've got the pockets of pieces, we've got the red down here, we've got the black up here, and then as with the jigsaw puzzle, we always look for a beginning and an end. We get that outline to give us some idea of where to frame all of this. Now we have something to work with. This gives us focus. So the next step is where we start sequencing. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna use temporal order of actions to try and figure out which actions of that related group go where. And this is exceptionally important. It's not enough to just know that an action occurred. Imagine that you had a book and you tore all the pages out, you threw them up in the air and they all came back down on your desk. You could pick up every page, read every page, and you would have some general understanding of the story, but because it's not presented in a particular order, you'd still be confused. You would not be absolutely sure of what could be going on in the storyline. Well, putting the pieces in order is part and parcel to the crime scene reconstruction. <clears throat> Realize that our order will always be partial. If you get a crime scene reconstruction, you go A, B, C, D, E, F, G in linear form, you're wrong. I pretty much can guarantee you that. We're never going to see all of the relationships. We're never going to understand all the chronology. We're only going to get a partial picture. That's all we're going to get. 
that picture is going to be very convoluted. There'll be varying divergent chains and then chains, causal chains that will reconverge and then diverge again. But we have to capture it. And as we described, this is the point when we start capturing it in a physical sense. I generally work with a whiteboard and post-it notes. You don't want to do this on paper because it's going to change and change dramatically over time. So as you start to recognize some relationship, you put it up on the post-it board, you draw a line, say, hey, this follows this, and you draw that line. And then you add them as you go along. But as I said, don't do it on paper just yet because that flow chart will go through multiple iterations. So we work this sequence in these smaller sections, okay? And we have this flow chart. And we start flow charting now and we never really stop. Flow charting is going to be continuous from this point on. Remember, we talked about chronology. We have two types of chronology. We've got time, we've got sequence. Both have value, but in honesty, the sequential is probably more important to crime scene reconstruction. We're looking at two actions. We ask very simply, did this action precede this? Did it follow it? Was it simultaneous? And we ask that about every action to every other action. As we build little causal chains, if we know that the beginning of this causal chain followed some other action, well, then we know that causal chain, all the rest of that causal chain followed that action as well. So you start capturing this and with time, what happens is the picture starts to become less muddied. We start to see a little bit more clearly about the activity and order. Talked about auditing, and auditing very simply is just running down contradictions. You think about it, every scene has contradictions, some more than others. And auditing is just a way of trying to resolve the contradictions if that's possible. We can't resolve all contradictions. And we're effectively, we're running things, we say in the United States, we run it down the rabbit hole. We're going deep, trying to figure out various cause, and we really look at causal chains to decide when a causal chain breaks down that would allow us to know that that couldn't have happened. And to understand an auditing, I'll give you a very simple example. So I had a situation in which a young man uh, died of a gunshot wound. The police went to the scene and they determined it was suicide. And because they determined it was suicide, they started making mistakes. They kind of rushed things. They did not document everything because, hey, it's a suicide. Well, the father came along after the fact and he said, no, 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 my son was murdered. And there were various aspects, some very important aspects of the scene that were not documented. One of the claims that the father presented, and it was brought to the father by another analyst, was that his son was dragged and moved to his final position after he shot somewhere. But we, he did document the wound to the back of the head. So let's think about that. In this instance, what is not in question, what everybody will agree to is that he received a gunshot wound to the top of his head. Whether that's entry or exit, that can be argued, but there's a gunshot wound. He bled and he bled heavily as a result of that wound and he came to be in a seated position as observed. So we think of that as a causal chain. Gunshot received, heavy bleeding occurred, victim came to be in a seated position. So let's consider the analyst claim his belief demands, if we incorporate his belief, we have to have the victim being moved. And that, of course, has some place because after he shoots him and he starts bleeding, he can't immediately move him. He has to then move him. So it has a place it goes. Gunshot received, heavy bleeding, victim was moved, victim came to be in the seated position. If this hypothesis is correct, if this analyst is correct, then what other action had to have occurred 
what other part of the causal chain had to have occurred in order to complete this series? And that's simply that the victim had to have been in a prior position. If he was moved, he was somewhere else. And of course, that has a location, a, a place within this picture. Gunshot received, heavy bleeding occurred, the victim was in a prior position, the victim was moved, and then he came to be in the seated position. If that's true, then you think about that. What does that give us to test whether that may be true or not? If he was in a prior position and already bleeding, then there should be evidence of this bleeding in the scene, somewhere where he was moved from. But in this instance, that isn't the case. What we find is all the blood is contained between the door and his final position. So given this break in the causal chain, something that must have occurred if the analyst was correct that he was moved, we can now be confident, no, that didn't occur. It could not have occurred. So that's auditing in the simplest sense. We look at the contradictions, we try to run it down and say, okay, where does the causal chain fail? Can we resolve it? Can we refute one or the other of some claim? Ultimately, we get these puzzle pieces all coming together for the little pockets. So we know that suddenly now, and let me get my cursor up there, we're starting to see a picture of a race car. And over here, those colors are starting to give us a picture of the, the uh, roadway. But now what we want to do is we want to connect the events themselves. And we're going to use the same temporal relationships that we used before for dealing with the little pods. But we're going to look at that broader perspective. And we're going to try and correlate the events in relationship to one another. And you think about it, we have an event A, we have an event B, we have an event C, event E, and event D. Well, maybe we can connect event B action one and event D action one. We know that they must have occurred after action A or event A action one. So now we draw the line. We now have some relationship between those. And maybe we can connect action two of event A to event C action one. And then maybe we can connect event B action two to some event in, in C or some action in C and ultimately uh, to E. Notice that we have no, no, we don't have any way of correlating event B action one and event B action two with what's happening down here. Nor do we have any way of knowing what, how this relates to these actions or this action. But there's no line, so there's no relationship. All we know is these preceded that, which then means this causal chain is intact. This preceded that, which means this causal chain was intact, and this preceded that. And I think I'm missing one line. So we're never going to bring it all together. We're never going to get a linear approach. I'm running a little longer than I expected, but let me continue on. I think we'll meet uh, Pablo's uh, timeline. We use crossover actions to do this. Now, there are going to be direct crossover actions, simple. Hey, there's a wounding in the hallway. The victim is found uh, with terminal activity in the bedroom. That's a direct relationship. It's very apparent that will connect what's going on in the living room with what's going on in the bedroom. Those contingent actions will help us. But remember the non-contingent actions. Those non-contingent actions can be helpful as well. So let's take an example. We have two people dead in the scene. One is in the kitchen, and sometime after they went to their final position, flour was spilled and spilled onto the floor and onto them. So we know the flour was spilled after the fact, and then someone stepped in the flour. Well, those don't really help us understand what's happening specifically to this victim. They're non-contingent. Whether the flour was spilled or not, they'd still be dead. So we got flowers spilled. We know the barefoot, uh, the, the barefoot stepped into the flower. All right. Out in the living room, we have another victim. And in the living room, that victim, his left foot, which is what stepped in the flower, 
it's clean. There's no flour there. But as we look at it, we suddenly encounter that there's flour in kind of the form of a footprint underneath the victim's body. That, again, is not really contingent to what happened to him in this room. But that information, the floor was stepped on, the victim too then fell into position. We can then start to connect. Well, the barefoot stepped into the flower, and oh, by the way, the flower spilled on victim one in the final position. So this is how non-contingent actions can help bring these divergent chains together. Ultimately, these crossover actions let us fill in our picture. But remember, the picture is never gonna be complete. We're never gonna see the whole picture. How define that picture is or is not, is anyone's guess, we won't know until we go through the process. Once our flow chart's complete, we want to validate. We want to challenge it ourselves. And that, this is a flow chart. So what do you do? You put this up and over a period of time, you come back to it and you challenge the claims that you've made. Are the statements objective? Nava perceives a threat. Tamayo fires into the master bedroom. How, are these statements of action objective? Is there a better way to make uh, to state them? And then you look at the order in which you presented them. Here I've got Nava perceives a threat. Nava fires into the master bedroom. I'm saying that happened sometime after Nava and Myers and Tamaya in, were inside the trailer. By the way, remember we said Something can precede an action, something can follow an action, and something could be simultaneous. When I have simultaneous actions, this is how I describe them or I write them on my flow chart, just so I know that I think they're occurring simultaneously. But the issue is that I wanna put this up and I wanna go through it over a period of time. Because when you put it up, you come back to it a couple days later and you look at it hard, you're gonna see errors you're gonna see logic errors that you missed. And the other thing is sometimes when you have this up, you'll see holes in the analysis. You'll say, I know that some activity is going on here, and that may lead you back into the crime scene to look for additional evidence and data that might let you fill in that blank. Ultimately, we're gonna take this, write it up. I don't put it on paper until I've gone through this whole uh, review process that I'm confident of it, because I don't want to have to create this multiple times. It's going to be on my whiteboard. And of course, for every one of these actions, there's a report that says, Nava perceives a threat. Whatever the foundation of that statement is, will be in the report. Now I'm going to hand it off, give it to someone for a complete peer review, and in that, I want someone to come in and challenge my statements, challenge my order, uh, and make me prove my foundation. So effectively, that's event analysis. We collect the data, we identify actions, we put the actions into little pods. You know, these are related, these are related. We sequence those actions. We audit when it's necessary. When we find a, a significant contradiction, we try to resolve the contradiction if we can. Then we come back and we have the little pods, the events in order. We try to put the, uh, the events into a sequence as well. Still using the idea of crossover actions. How does this action in this event relate to this action in this event? Ultimately, we get that final result. We validate it. We peer review it. And we end up with an understanding and how much that understanding resolves what we want to know or don't know. Again, I can't answer that. Sometimes you get the, we call it DRT, dead right there. Sometimes there's just not enough data in which to really honestly build a good crime scene reconstruction. Other times we may be able to make very, very precise statements about things that are happening. And what that does for us is that it gives us, the methodology gives us focus, the methodology keeps us on track, 
and it ensures that we go about resolving this complex problem and it leads to more effective knowledge. And of course, if we have more effective knowledge, we can answer judges and juries' questions more effectively. We understand better what's happening. Crime scene analysis is not hard, but you must follow a methodology. You gotta understand those ideas. You gotta look for them, whether you're on scene or looking at it after the fact. You have to live by the rules so that your document and your opinion remains objective. And then you can take that objective information and evaluate all of the subjective information that comes to you. Eyewitnesses tell us something, eyewitnesses aren't always right. Certainly suspects tell us things and those aren't always right. So that's the value of crime scene analysis. It allows us to objectively decide what we believe or what we don't believe about the more subjective aspects of the investigation. And with that, that is my presentation. And uh, are there any questions I might answer?